Welcome to Poker Road Radio, hosted by Gavin Smith, Joe Seabock, and Bart Hansen. Poker Road Radio is the only poker radio show with a two-time, five-diamond prelim final table finisher working the board. Go Court! Go Court! Oh, man, that has got to be one of the gayest intros <laughs> I've ever heard, Seabock. You know what I like? She says it like it's like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. <laughs> Go Court! And then well, I feel like an orb should appear and Congratulations to Court. Actually, more on that issue. We're going to talk a little more about that I just want to say, Court absolutely crushed the prelims. Yeah, that's but okay. but I do have to have a caveat for this. It was it was so cute. You know, I'd see him every day, and I'd be like, Court, you're destroying it. I don't understand what's going on. Tell me tell me what you're doing. For those of you that know, this is Court Harrington. You know, he works Pocket Fives. He he works the Poker Road. Um, and he, he's telling me he's playing so good. He's not playing so well. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. And I said, Tell me some hands. Tell me some hands. He says, Well, you know, I was playing this guy. This guy flopped the set. I you know I turned to flush. So this other hand, this guy had two aces, you know, and I flopped a set. He said this one guy made a straight on the turn. I made a, a flush on the river. So it's basically just a long suck out, <laughs> string of suck outs. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, well, it's always fun when it's like that. I don't know if it's going to last, but the truth be told, he played awesome. You know, I played with him a little bit, and he crushed and made two final tables at the prelim, so it was unbelievable. So obviously he's playing awesome as well as running well. Well, we're here on day two here from the Bellagio in the beautiful Barry Greenstein suite. That's something that we haven't gone over uh, it looks like a tornado has hit this place, True. Rock, but uh, we got five people living here. I now, know, I know. You started the day with 125,000 in chips, and True. miraculously, you ended the day <laughs> with 125,000 in chips. What is going on? Now, we've got about 165 people left right. the original uh, 664. Well, I'm consistent, you know. I like to finish every day with the same amount. Uh, no, you know, I had my typical, you know, stupid up and down, you know, vortex of a day. Came in with 125, as you said, um, played you know a little too aggressively in the first level and ended up uh, running that down to about 70,000. So obviously I'm a little irritated. You know, obviously I need to know I need to tighten it up a little bit because people are expecting you know me to tilt. Um, so I ran that in, managed to run it back up to about 130. Um, you know, and the rest of it was was pretty solid. Then uh, moved to a new table with uh, Gus Gus Hansen. Um, had a tough hand with him where I ended up giving him some chips in a bad way. Went back down to 70,000. Actually ran that up to 180. Um, and then just kind of had some tough hands as, as the day wore, wore on to finish up at 125. Now, we have to talk about that hand because, you know, I was in here prepping for the show around right. 5 o'clock. And um, I hear a very loud Barry Greenstein outside the door. It seems like he was yelling at somebody. And then we came to the conclusion that he was giving you a lecture right. on how badly you played that hand. Well, you know what's so brutal is <laughs> it will literally happen... As I'm playing. It's like real-time criticism. It's not like the tournament's over, I come upstairs, and then we talk. It's like I'm getting texts about the hand as I'm sitting at the table still playing. You know, so I will never say a bad thing about Bear's advice. That I am where I am because he's he's taught me how to play, obviously. Um, but, yeah, man, sometimes you just want to be like, you know, go F yourself. I'm playing the tournament right now. <laughs> let me let me play. But he's right. You know, I did make a mistake. Now you had raised pre-flop with pocket 10s. No, no, no. What happened was... Yeah, go through the hand. What happened was uh, Gus had raised an early position, um, and I was on the button with two 10s. Now, with uh, different kind of players, you know, you do different kinds of things. Um, but I hadn't played with Gus very much, and I didn't know exactly what he was going to do. So I elected, I elected to just call... You know, the stacks were pretty big. I didn't, I didn't want to get in a spot where I re-raise them, and then he re raised you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, the pot's way out of control for a hand, like two tens. So I liked the call. Um, in hindsight, and, uh, you know, after talking to Bear, I think it probably is the right thing to do against a player like Gus or like Gavin. Very, very loose. You know, just raise them right there. You know, probably 80% of the time you're going to take down the pot. Um, I elected not to. Uh, I just called his raise, and then Beth Shack uh, called from the big, uh, the big blind. And then the flop came, came down king high. And uh, Beth checked, Gus checked, and generally I would make a bet here, you know, with two tens of w- with one over card up. But again, I think I was just a little uh, wary of Gus, you know, because I haven't played with him much. So this honestly was the first time I had. So I checked behind, so that was probably my first mistake. Then on the turn... Well, even before you go on the turn, right here, let's do it, you know. Sure. I- I'm imagining, too, that Beth Jack's got something to do with the fact that maybe more heads up you're going to make that bet. Uh, no, I don't no. think it had anything to do with Beth. I mean, I wasn't afraid of Beth being in the pot. I think it was just more of Gus. You know, it's very odd when a player raises in that spot and then checks the flop. Checks a king high flop. It's very, very, very odd. Um, so it just threw me off a little bit. I didn't expect, you know, Gus to do that, but he did. So, you know, really, it didn't have much to do with Beth. 
Um, but at any rate, you know, then a, a guard, you know, a, a baby card came on the turn. Beth checked. Gus bet. Um, and here, here was my mistake. You know, at this point, Gus probably doesn't have a king. You know, it's probably one of those spots where he doesn't have a king or he has three kings, something like that. Um, but again, I don't think that Gus is a bad enough player to do the rookie thing where you flop a huge hand and then check. Right. So I was pretty sure he didn't have a king. Um, so probably what I should have done is raised him right there, you know, and just taken down the pot um, and gone with it. Um, but again, you know, trying to keep the pot small, being a little wary of, of Gus, uh, I, I elected to call. Beth folded, and then a queen rolled out on the turn. On the river. Excuse me, excuse me, on the river. Yep. And, you know, Gus just made a sick value bet, you know, and I was pretty sure he didn't have a king. It was just an issue of whether that hit him, and I ended up paying him off on the end. So it's just, you know, several mistakes along the way. Um, kind of irritating hand, you know, in general, probably that I should have just raised in the first place. You know, I, I, it turned out that he had queen jack of clubs, so he did, you know, end up uh, getting me on the river. But if I raise him, you know, before the flop, he's going to call in all likelihood, and then, you know, the king uh, high flop comes, he checks, I bet, and he folds. Now, he was, the, over. was the bear saying that this was just a monumental mistake? I mean, no. he was... No, I don't really make you know monumental errors. I don't think anymore. You know, not just not like these crazy errors. Right. You know, it's just these like razor thin you know mistakes that you just can't make in you know in big time tournament poker. If you do, you're in trouble. I mean, you're just gonna you're gonna bleed chips. You're gonna lose them a little bit at a time, and it's just a bad decision. Interesting. You were at the same table with John uh, Craniac and Tom Coral, both players who have bubbled. Uh, seventh. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Earlier. yeah, earlier. Yeah, starting off. Yeah, we were yeah. chatting. <laughs> we were chatting. It was really funny. We were talking about because uh, I have two sevens, obviously, and the, each of those guys have one each. So we're saying that uh, you know they should go off and write about how much we're crying and bitching and, and moaning <laughs> about the fact that we can never make the final table. So again, approximately 165 uh, players left. 664 total. Again, the prize pool is 9.61 right. million or 9.66 million. I'm winning it. Phil Ivy. I'm winning. He's, I don't, I don't, he's still Phil the Ivey. chip leader. F Phil Ivy. 425,000. Lee Markle with 370. Some other interesting. Names and an odd medic seems like the guy's always there. Daniel Lahi, Negrano there in the top eight. Theo Tran and Roy Winston seems like that guy's there a lot too. I want to ask you about now. We are going to get to uh, the Doyle Brunson second part of the interview right. today, and that uh, it runs a little bit longer, so we're kind of doing a shorter show without okay. Gavin here because uh, you know we did about 30 minutes on Doyle's life. Very very interesting stuff. I would say don't miss it. You know, right keep on. listening to the show. Um, you know. Phil Ivey, people, you know, see him in cash games. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he doesn't play all that many tournaments. I mean, he's only playing the bigger tournaments, right? right? So how is he as a tournament player if you have the opportunity to play with him in a Nolan right. Golden tournament? Well, obviously, I mean, it goes without saying he's very good. You know, I mean, his records, you know, speak for um, themselves. Um, you know, basically, I think Phil plays, you know, a similar way to how I play or Barry plays. You know, it's a pressure game. You know, it really is just a race to, to get the most chips. So that way you can start applying pressure, put people in, in tough spots, and make sure that they're guessing. Um, I think that the thing that Phil does better than anyone else is that Phil, Phil does, never dogs it. If he flops three aces, he just bets that thing right into you. He does not care. He bets every street. He bets his big hands. He doesn't try to trap people. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the nice things about players that are, uh, you know, as aggressive as Phil. Um, you know, or myself, Phil's probably a little more aggressive than I am. Um, but we don't we don't have to ever try to trap people or slow play or or do anything like that because we're right. always hammering we're always pushing it we're always getting after you so when we flop a big hand it looks exactly like when you have absolutely nothing um, and I think that Phil is the best at that because we all go through that you know you you raise with two aces and an ace flops and then you're like oh maybe God I don't want to trap this guy and you know right. get sneaky Phil doesn't do that he just smashes your head on every hand. And that way he really gets you, you know, you decide to make a move, and all of a sudden that's the hand that he's got three kings. Right, right. You know, and then right. you're out of there. Um, so I think that's his biggest strength is just his consistency in, in the style that he plays. Now, that was a hell of a piece of work. See, Phil knows what's up. <laughs> what, are the other, <laughs> what are the other interesting characters of poker? And I don't know how many people out there actually know him. He was near the leaderboard at the end of yesterday and today, and now he's back down to right where you are is Raymond Davis. Uh, <laughs> definitely an interesting character, Mr. Sideways Hat. <laughs> I mean, this guy, he gets chips so long. Whoa. Wow. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't does, know what that means. Does that mean we want to kill know, Ray, or is he dead? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, Sorry, he, Ray. <laughs> he gets chips, but then he somehow just can't hang on to him. even, like, more so than you. I mean, you right. make runs at the end. He's right, just right, there, right. and maybe he's only got, like, one speed. Well, Ray's kind of a, you know, I like Ray. He's a nice guy. I mean, a lot of people don't like him. Yeah. He's just a bit of a knucklehead. Um and he just never, you know, he just, he. I've seen him play hands where he gets people to call huge bets on the end where he's got the absolute nuts, you know, and I've seen people, you know, call him when he's just bluffing off all his chips. He just, you know, I don't even know if it, if it's that he only has one speed or he just lacks table feel, 
you know, I think that might have something to do with it, where he just doesn't sense, like, this guy's got a big hand, this guy doesn't, you know. He just kind of goes and he fires on all cylinders and he just doesn't let up, um, which obviously I can relate to. You know, that was basically the the beginning of my career. That's all I did. Um, but, you know, I equate it to, you know, when you, when you talk about baseball pitchers, there's throwers and then there's pitchers. You know, and I play, I, I love the Cubs. You know, that's my favorite team. Kerry Wood, when he came up, was a thrower. I mean, this guy was, th- you know, 100 miles an hour every single pitch. He wasn't named in the Mitchell Report, was he? I hope not. I don't, no, no. K- Kerry's good. Kerry's good. <laughs> I love him. But that's, the, I think Ray is a thrower. Raymond Davis is a thrower. He's not, you know, he's not a pitcher. He can't get in there and, and feel the nuances and all this stuff in these tournaments, from what I've seen. You know, if he can, maybe it's just I haven't seen it. But, you know, I just think he gets after it too much. And, and to round it off, just an interesting piece of information. Again, Roy Winston with 204,000. He's in the mix. Right. Apparently he is, uh, and I don't know this for sure, but it seems like he's nicknamed himself the Oracle. <laughs> he's Roy the Winston Oracle Seabock. And uh, Card Player actually did an interview with him, and right. he said, uh, you can't keep the I Oracle thought. down. <laughs> so I, I don't really know. What it is with this guy? Yeah. Uh, he seems to be kind of a character. I don't know where he came from. Roy, Roy's a good dude. You know, he's a nice guy. Yeah. You know, I hung out with him, but he, he told me about the thing that Car Player wrote up. You know, call him the Oracle. I don't know how I got the nickname. You know, I hope he didn't give it to himself, <laughs> man, because that's just not the kind of nickname you can give yourself. This is crazy stuff. We're gonna be back here with. Uh, we had a whole load of Bluff Magazine contest uh, submissions. Yeah, we'll be back with that. The douche. And some emails. The douche. So stick around, and Joey and I will be back on Poker Road Radio. The douche! <laughs> <laughs> hey everyone, it's Joe Stapleton. You might remember me as a guy that used to host this show. Some people like me. I think Bart's doing a great job though. And I'm Scott Huff. And I used to host this show too. Some of you liked me. Some of you said that Stapleton was greater than Huff. But Bart's doing a good job. Anyway, we want to tell you about our new show that we host together so you get both of us. It's called Two Jacks in the Hole. You can find it on PokerRoad.com right next to Poker Road Radio. Even though the show is not even a little bit about poker, it is enjoyed by both poker players and non-poker players alike. So go out and tell at least a thousand of your friends. Two Jacks in the Hole, absolutely nothing to do with poker on PokerRoad.com. I can't win cock, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and we are back here from the Doyle Brunson Five Diamond Classic at the Bellagio. Joe Seabock and I am Bart Hansen. Bluff Magazine Contest. What a response we've gotten from this. We've got Exciting. 15 new nicknames here, Seabock. I do have to say, it feels really weird to sign pictures of yourself and like give them to people like that to me is just weird and so especially I can, when people really are looking for the other autograph on the exactly magazine too so i just assume <laughs> that it really it's just bare and like i'm a throwing in it and that makes me feel better because it's very odd the whole well, that's the hand thing that you're doing you're talking you know you're looking a little gay there you know like this i yeah, always look gay if you if you go back and look at a photo of uh, c box one of the gayest photos ever yeah. from the first what uh, can i do from the first show of uh that's Vegas. why the girls like me because i seem gave it when you know Get out of business? I'm not going. <laughs> All right. How about the first submission here from Jim? Uh, actually, you know what? Before we even go into this, I've I got to preface this. Some of these people, I don't know, our listeners are just absolutely insane. Okay. Mike from Ontario, Canada. Canada. Canada? <laughs> Bart the Handjob Hansen. Okay. Oh, I like it. Matthias from Sweden. Bart Sperm Bank Hansen. I like or, it. Or Louis from New Orleans. Bart the Cocksucker Hansen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? I'm not going to lie to you. Those three men, geniuses. If I started a I mean, country, are, I would let them leave These it. are actual submissions. Geniuses. I mean, we're looking for real geniuses. nicknames here. Give me a break. All right, 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 right. right, right. I hate Bart. I hate those are real nicknames. <laughs> okay, so I hate to tell you, though, that's genius right there. Genius in a bottle. <laughs> All right, Jim. He says, the Cerebral Assassin. That's not even a okay. possibility. Not Aaron, even a possibility. Aaron, the nude housefly. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of cool. Bart, the nude housefly. Answer. I like that okay. one. That was kind of cool. Scott says uh, the beautiful one because Bart is so beautiful. That was one that was kind of close to mine. I don't think so. I don't think so. All right. So. How about this one? You might like this one yeah. with going along with the, uh, you know, the, the <laughs> ka, uh theme. The Kadoosh. The Kadoosh? Ka- yeah. Cub, caveman, and the Kadoosh. What's a Kadoosh, though? All right. That came from Cowboy. That's not even a word. I could just make up C words that don't exist. Bobby in Atwater, California, Carly Simon, because Bart is so vain. Bart Carly. That's kind of funny. Yeah. Bart's so vain. Vain. <laughs> Chris from Wisconsin, the Asian lady killer. 
No. no. <laughs> Brandon Wolf from Kaiser, Oregon. Super 8, because I got 8th on a couple of the final tables. No. Uh, John Lotus, Bart okay. Asian Nipples Hansen. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Josh in California, live at the mic, Bart. Mm, Interesting. It's too catchy. I don't know this thing. Uh, <laughs> Thomas from Newcastle, Indiana. Splenda, because he's a weak substitute for Scott Hoff and Joe Hello. Stapleton. Oh, <laughs> that's pretty good. Black <laughs> Elvis sends in a submission, the Cash Master. No. Uh, Scott, the narcissist. Ooh, I like that one. I will say this. The narcissist. People, if you're sending in a nickname that is in any way nice (laughs) or in any way could reflect favorably upon Bart, it will not be picked. So do not waste your time at the computer. And how about the last one here? Doug from uh, D.C., the kick-ass host. Bart, the kick-ass host. Uh, I mean, do we need... (laughs) I don't even want to say it. Just just play this. (laughs) So which one do you like out of that one? Out of those... What What was the first one that I liked? Well, the nude housefly. That one is pretty effing funny. The nude housefly. <laughs> <laughs> Splenda. Splenda's pretty good. Yeah. You want to um, give it to the nude housefly from Aaron? I think we got to go for the nude housefly. All right, the nude housefly. Congratulations, Bart, to Aaron. Cut the caveman in the nude housefly. <laughs> Again, if you want to send your submissions in, Very send nice. an email to prradio at pokeroad.com. Pradio at pokeroad.com. Hit him with the, and, hit him with the um, phone number. Hit him with the phone number. Well, we're going to get to that in a second. Oh, we're here. doing it. Yeah, right. 1877 road 1877-836-7623. And when you send those emails in for the submissions, please include your mailing address please, yeah. so that we can send those bluff magazines. And if you want, if you guys want to have the Joe Seabach figure cut out of the magazine so it's just Barry Green's name. <laughs> Barry Green's name. So just let us know. We're happy to do it. We're going to go to our uh, a phone call here from today. So again, you can call us one eight seven seven eight three six road So let's get to it here right on the voicemails. Oh, hey, guys. Awesome show. This is Chris in Wisconsin calling. What up? I guess I'm calling with more of a comment than a question, but maybe you guys could just comment it on the air, is that uh, I'm a recreational player uh, and have been for quite a while, and I really enjoy playing poker, both tournaments and and, and uh, uh, cash games. But what I've noticed lately is that the there are certain players who either consider themselves pros or think they're pros. Like Bart? That Bart have a tendency to degrade <laughs> the play of other players. Now, I've been playing poker about 18 years, and I never really noticed that too much, even from the po- pros uh, when a bad beat was put on them or something. They would not, um, you know, call the guy an idiot. And really what it's doing, I think, is really discouraging the exact people that they want uh, playing in the game, which is the non-pro, the the, the small business person like sure. myself who has the money and enjoys playing poker um, and is not a professional and does not want to be yet by the action of these players is actually discouraging them from returning. So I know I kind of went on. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah, we got you, we got you. Uh, you know, what do you think about that? It's definitely something that's I don't, become really more and more prevalent. Well, you know, I don't actually, I don't insult players anymore. You know, now... Did you, when you well, first no, started? Well, here's the thing. I don't insult them anymore. Now I just punch them in the face. If they make a bad play, <laughs> I just blast them. I just blast them in the but head. But you know what this guy's talking about, right? Of course. You know, and... and How about part- David Delfish, uh, Uliet? He does right. it all the time, Here's the right? problem. Here's the problem. Obviously, it goes without saying, this is a... Not only is it a strategic mistake, it's simply just a class mistake. It's just not cool. I mean, don't, you know, it's just, it's not classy. It's very, it's just not something that you want to do. What's up with you, bro? <laughs> Strategically speaking, he's absolutely right. You're going to chase the bad players away. So even from that, on that level, it's, very, it's a bad decision. You know, even today, I saw Gus, you know, take the sickest beat. You know, he got it all in on the turn with a straight, he had the nuts. Um, and the guy had two pair, and the guy hit, um, you know, he made a full house on the river, and the guy screams, jumps up, all this stuff. And to me... The excessive celebrating is very, very similar to, you know, criticizing other people's play. It's just not something that, that you do. Unfortunately, we've got the Phil Helmuths, we've got the Devilfishes, we've got these guys on TV. They make it look cool. They make it look like it's something that you should do. So all the new players and all of, you know, the younger guys are in uh, women, they're coming up playing the game. They see that, and they think that's what you do. Now, I do have you know? to throw a player into that mix of people that berate the other people. And you would never, <laughs> ever think of the day. Take off! But maybe not in live play, but... Take uh, off. Over the break, I played a lot on Full Tilt, some of the stud high-low games. I'm not going to give out Alan Kessler's name because he didn't want Data! his uh, name, but Data. he berates the guys in stud high-low. He was the biggest ass on there, and I'm like, who is this guy? And yeah. then he wrote to me, and he's like, hey, Bart, what's going on? You know me. I'm like, who is this? He's like, oh, this is a, you know, I'm a smaller pro. Uh, Gavin calls me Chainsaw on your show. And I was like, what? Alan, Ke- well, you know what? Alan thinks he that was- he is the best player on the planet. 
It doesn't matter what it is. He would call people idiots. He yeah. would call them stupid. But, of course, behind the computer. Well, he, which no, I no, find a little amusing. Well, he, he doesn't do it so much live. He whines more live. He doesn't uh-huh. call people names. But he whines and complains. What? You know, Al, whatever. He's, you know, he's not a bad kid. He just, he's got a good, he, it's just his thing. He just loves to, like, share his misery and point out people's mistakes. And Alan does think he is an amazing, amazing poker player. Amazing, amazing poker player. Of course, he went you know, bust here on day two. I've probably well. busted Alan 700 times in the, the two years I've been playing. I mean, literally. He, every time Bear or I come to his table, he always goes, oh, the family, they're out to get me again. Because he and I have, bu- have probably busted him more than anyone else in the last two years. So now, he dreads us. Now, it's pretty fitting that Gavin is not here. Because in response to the first show that we did here in Vegas, right. we got some... Vengeful emails really? coming in from what Gavin said about the caveman. Uh, well, no, this was yeah, this is about the caveman and yeah. about his uh, you know response to ghosting online accounts. I know, um, I know. PR radio at pokerroad.com again. PR radio at pokerroad.com. You can email us. We'll read them if you like them. Subject: Completely disagree with Gavin. It's not often that I disagree with the caveman, but on this issue of selling online accounts while in the midst of a tournament, I must violently disagree with him. You need to look at this from the perspective of, a top, of not a top player, from an amateur's perspective. The last thing I want to see on the other side of the table is a seasoned pro. Therefore, if I'm lucky enough to make it really deep in a tournament, and I'm up against those of similar skill, right. I should not be afraid that a pro will replace someone. And he gives the example of golf, Joe. He's like, you know, Gavin, what if you're up against Seabock and you're ahead by a couple holes after, you know, 11 holes and you're playing for a million dollars, and all of a sudden Seabock, you know, goes on to the 13th hole and now right. he's playing against Tiger Woods. We did that once, actually. <laughs> we were drinking a lot. Tiger, I called him in. I wasn't golfing well. You, you know, know <laughs> at the end of the day, and I agree, you know, and I, say, and I stated that on the first show. The bottom line is this. It, it's, it's a two-pronged issue. You, have to, you can look at it either from an online poker rules perspective, or you can simply look at it from a competitive morals perspective. And I said it before, there is no competitive endeavor that you can put this same situation into and, and find a way that it makes sense to me that somebody could take over. You cannot do it. It doesn't work. Clearly, almost every single person would say that that is wrong. Um, but these guys are arguing from a different point. And, I mean, all I can tell you guys out there is Barry also agrees with Gavin. You know, so it's not just knuckleheaded caveman. I mean, it's also, you know, obviously somebody that we all respect, um, you know, his intelligence, which is Bear. I don't agree with them. I think that it's still wrong. But their feeling is that if it doesn't, you know, break explicitly break these rules, then you can do it. To me, it's common sense, man. It, to me, it is literally common sense that you can't do something like this. Another email comes in you know? from Frank. says, very much disagree with your views. How can anyone argue that this is not cheating when a player already knocked out? And that was the case with Sorrell and many other top on- online players doing this well as getting a second, third, or fourth chance by right. buying an account going deep. Especially Gavin seems completely naive or dumb about this and not realizing how this is damaging to the image of online poker. Right. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. You know, people are just... But I will tell you this. It goes on constantly. I mean, we can sit here and tell ourselves, well, this is isolated. It only happened this one time. Not true. Happens so much in online you know, poker, and that's just a fact. You know, just because people aren't getting caught. It is happening constantly. Now, we didn't get a chance to talk, you know, briefly that day about, you know, somebody brought up to me, you know, well, doesn't cheating go on live, Joe? I mean, have you ever seen any instances? I mean, right. the whole people don't realize why people turn their cards over at Showdown when you're all in. Right, that exactly. came about from chip dumping, right? right? from collusion. Exactly. Yeah. Just that. You know, you mm-hmm. get in a situation, you make a big raise to isolate, get somebody out, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, you fold a, a good hand. There's a myriad of ways to do it. I haven't seen myself a lot of cheating, but also keep in mind I've only been playing, you know, two, two and a half years. I do know, you know, the only stories I know of are things like people being super satellites. I know I'm not going to name, you know, the player's name, but, you know, like a, a wife or a girlfriend maybe had a lot of chips and literally pocketed chips and gave them, you know, to her spouse or her boyfriend um, to help him in the super satellite at one point. So that's the kind of stuff that you hear about. Obviously, it happens more often than not, and truth be told, it's a grayer issue than people think. Some people would say, you know, when Barry and I are at the same table, um, that we soft play each other. And, you know, I'd be sitting here lying if I, you know, to say anything differently. We don't soft play in a conventional sense, but, you know, if Barry makes a raise and I have two aces, I, boom. Right. I'm, you're never, you're not going to try to trap him. I'm getting right. in. I'm not trying to trap him and get all right. the chips. And, you know, that's a fact. I mean, we can all sit here and say it doesn't exist, but it's, you do play differently against your friends or your family or this or that. You try to keep it to a minimum. Barry and I certainly would never do anything that was wrong. I certainly would never fold two kings or you know, do anything like that. 
Um, but you know, it is. There's some give and take there. You know, it's a gray issue. It's a very gray issue. Well, then, doesn't the the question come up then? Is it an inherent flaw in in the sense that you know, poker is a game like right. chess. You know, will it never be pure while playing on the internet? You know, you don't have world class chess tournaments going on the internet because right. of the possibility of computer cheating. You know, what about this? Now, in this case, there's millions and millions of dollars on the line, but. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we ever think that it's going to be straight? Well, I don't think that it is, but this is the issue. This is the point that Gavin and Bear and these other guys make is exactly that. It's not the same game. It cannot be the same game. Mm -hmm. It never will be. So, therefore, you can't put the same um, framework of rules on it. I still say you, you try to make it as close to the live game as possible. If, for example, I think that if websites could, you know, through some, you know, a camera on the computer or, you know, fingerprints or keystrokes, if it was very easy to do that so they could know, literally know who was sitting there playing, they would. It's just, you just can't do it. It's not feasible. You know, it's not cost efficient. There's a, tons of reasons why it's impossible to do. But I think they would if they could. You know, but I don't know. That, that's the argument is that it's a totally different game. So, therefore, how can you use the same rules? You can't do it. You know. Well, speaking of the masters of the live game, we're going to go to our part two of the Doyle Brunson interview. The master, absolutely. Um, and stick around because it was really great. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Enjoy. You guys, the thing that's cool about this part of the interview, Doyle gets into his life, you know, all the stuff that he went through, and Doyle loves to tell, tell stories, man. And he really opened it up for us yesterday. Yep. So stick around, and we will be back right here on Poker Road Radio. Got questions about your poker game? Save them for someone who cares like Poker Road Radio. Tune in every Sunday night to PokerRoad.com during the guaranteed online documents as Bob and Huff break down the hot topics in poker, interview the biggest names on tour about everything except strategy, and take your calls live. Heard of the 50-50 rule? You ain't heard nothing yet. Want to know if a pro's busto? Well, they probably are. But call and ask anyway. Maybe we'll get someone to call in and confirm it live. It's a poker forum over the airwaves. Come flame away on the Lord's Day. Big Poker Sundays with Huff and Bob. Sundays at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern on PokerRoad.com. Well, we're going to move on here uh, toward to you know kind of your background. Doyle, um, a lot of people didn't know you just talked about it, how you actually started off as an athlete. You were quite the basketball player, and you were drafted by the Minnesota Lakers, right? Yeah. And what what exactly <laughs> happened in between there that kind of put a halt to your to your career? Well, I, I had a real big junior year. Uh, we went to the Sweet 16 in the NCAA basketball. I, I ran second to the best uh, miler in uh, the country. For of course, I did that for two years. Uh, so the uh, the scouts came down to talk to me, but it, I had another year left, so they couldn't talk to me back in those days. Oh, you weren't allowed to go on at that point? No. You, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was different. And so they talked to my coach, and, you know, they was telling him that they had had their team set up. They had uh, George Mikan, you know, the biggest center, and they had a guy named Pollard. They had two second-team All-NBA players. Mm -hmm. And they needed a shooting guard, and that's what I was. And so they said that they told my coach that, well, we're taking him our first pick in the first round next year. And then I, that summer I busted my leg, and that was that was the end of my athletics. And it was a thing where you were just working. A, you know, it's funny you were just working a summer job, and it was just an accident. I made a mistake and worked for a while. <laughs> <laughs> wow, something Dumbass. that they probably don't do these days, right? But at College least, basketball at least you players from it. You never got another job again. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the break that you had actually wasn't repairable. Like well, maybe repairable, but you could never compete on on the same level. No, again? it was a, a real bad compound break, uh, and a country doctor said it. And uh, it didn't heal properly. I had to have a. Then I got finally went to an orthopedic doctor, and they rebroke it and did a bone graft. And but it was too late. The the leg had atrophied, and uh, uh, you know the quickness and and uh, everything was gone. And uh, so I, I just never could. Uh, it's the same thing. The reason I'm on the crutch now. It's a, it's from that. Wow. And it's amazing. You know, people that don't have like a traumatic physical injury when when it happened at the time. 
you know, what did they tell you? Did you know that it was going to be a long-term thing, or if you had gone to orthopedic right away, you think that you could have healed properly? I, I, did, I didn't know. I should, my, my dad should have uh, uh, got a orthopedic doctor to come in. They had uh, they offered to the the insurance company, mm-hmm. but uh, this local doctor had sent my leg, and everybody was talking about what a great job he did, you know, and everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I didn't really know any better, and uh, so how could you? Right, but I'm but I'm assuming. I mean, you know, having gone on and done the things you've done, you wouldn't change it and go back. And, I mean, maybe you wish you played basketball. Or you tell me. Do you, I mean, do you wish that you could have played basketball and wiped away the poker at this point? Why couldn't you do both? <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know. It was. Uh, I don't. I mean, it was just. It was my whole life. Uh, had been. I mean, I grew up out on a farm where uh, it looked like you never would get out, get away from the farm. Uh, it's poverty alley. Yeah, you know, and the only way I could get to college was with, through a, some kind of scholarship, and so that's where I worked uh, and ran, and then uh, I had I I, uh, I was the state champion in the mile. I was an all-state basketball player, so I I could choose from like a hundred different colleges w- once I graduated high school, but uh, my main focus was just I wanted to make the NBA, and and that's all I worked at. I didn't you know right. I didn't. Didn't concentrate on my studies, or didn't even really concentrate on the track. Uh, but I did. I worked my tail off pl- trying to learn how to play basketball, and I think I was probably a little ahead of my time. Uh, so I, I feel like I could have could have played in the NB- NBA back then. Yeah, it sounds like it. Now, so how do you shoot now? Uh, my shoulder, I can't shoot at all. <laughs> <laughs> so transition that. So you're laid up, and is that when you started to, you know, had the opportunity to start basically learning poker and start playing more and more? So when, when you were after the injury, when you when you were laid up, is that okay. really when the poker started kicking? Yeah, in? I went back to. Uh, actually, I was going to try to lay out a year and come back uh, the next year, mm-hmm. and but then when they had to re-break the leg, that was the end of that. But I still was on crutches and. Uh, I went back to get my uh, graduate, uh, my master's degree, and uh, I didn't have enough money to uh, pay my tuition and my uh, room and board, so I started playing poker. That's when I started. So in the in the college games, basically. Yeah, I had a lot of friends around at the different universities. So what year was this around? 1955. In Texas, right? Yeah, and I would travel on weekends. I would leave. I'd go down to the University of Texas and play poker down there, and then I'd the next week, I'd go like to Texas Tech. And oh, so you were like on a college poker tour. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I was. Poker tour. yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I, it was pretty obvious from the first that I was uh, better than most. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I always won, seemed like. And uh, I guess maybe I had to win to keep to survive. Yeah. But uh, and I don't know. It, it was still the competition was there, and uh, you know, I, I still that's what I still like. And what was the game back then when you guys would play in college, like back in the mid fifties? Well, we we played high level split. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we played five card stud. We played five card draw, and uh, uh, played low ball. Played a lot of low ball, and I didn't play hold until uh, like nineteen fifty seven or fifty eight after I had kind of turned pro, and uh, I caught on right away about hold them, and as most of those guys didn't. <laughs> and it was really like stealing back then, playing holding with those, you know. For some reason, they just couldn't they, they couldn't grasp it. Now, was holding was it was it a limit or a no limit game? At oh, first? it was no limit. No limit at there first. Was no limit games in Texas. So, and what, what <laughs> were the blinds be back then? That you uh, were when you started. Well, I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> We played a lot of one dollar and two dollar blinds. Really, yeah. and, and still so, play that so game the today. Average, <laughs> the average guy buying into the games that you bought into, you'd show up in a one dollar, two dollar game. What would you buy in for? Hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, maybe. Remember, this is in the late fifties. No, though. absolutely. Yeah, no, I know yeah. that's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. If, today, if, if, you, if you could find a one, two, and five game, that was a huge that game. That was a huge game. Yeah, yeah. One, yeah. two, and five. Yeah, and uh, so you know, of course, a no limit. You know, the losing players are going to be losing more quickly, right? As yeah. opposed to limit. So, you know, the better players must have just eaten it up. Yeah. Well, I well mean, and back then, back then, you had to beat the game and the gun, right? Well, you had, I mean, that was, that you was had be, you had to be part involved. of the risk. You had to worry about uh, getting arrested. We got arrested a lot. Yeah. Uh, we got cheated a lot. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it was. Uh, 
It was just part of it. I mean, that must have been something that you had to factor in. I would imagine. I mean, nowadays, like I take into account, you know, what am I going to do for my bankroll? What might eat right. into my bankroll? Back then, you know, you got to figure maybe every what couple months there might be some sort of situation where you get robbed or. Well, there was. We we did everything we could do to, to prevent that. We had, uh, I mean, Sailor and uh, Amarillo Slim and myself. We traveled together and and we've shared the bankrolls. Uh, that 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 sounds like it was some kind of conspiracy, but everybody knew it. And it didn't work to our advantage because if we ever did one thing wrong, they would never let two of us play in the game. Right. So in other words, if uh, one of us was first and they checked it and the other guy bet, they knew they wasn't going to get the guy that checked it wasn't going to come back in. Okay. Check right, right. Yeah. yeah. It has to be. It's got to be funny for you to look at, you know, guys like me and Gavin and, you know, hear us complain about anything. Because poker to you guys we don't is complain. like life and death. I mean, I mean, honestly, how do you how do you look at all the kids coming up and? I, look, I think they're <laughs> really spoiled. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Do- Doyle, you know, he's wrong. I'm not a kid. He's a kid. I'm not a kid. Did you ever feel that you were physically threatened at any of these types of games, Uh-oh. or you you were you were concerned? <laughs> many times. Like always. <laughs> <laughs> many, many, many times. I was always the biggest guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was two seventy, two eighty, and six foot three. And any time there's any trouble develops, uh, you know, everybody wants to to pick on the biggest guy there, especially if they've got some kind of an advantage, like a gun or a bat or something. And so I uh, I had to defend myself a lot in a lot of different ways. But, uh, again, it, it was – people wonder, you know, why would you do that? Uh, I don't know. I didn't have any responsibility. I was single, and I just had a good time. Yeah. Um you know, we're going to talk about a little bit about you're wearing uh, Doyle's Room uh, leather jacket, nice jacket. And uh, Doyle's Room, you know, it was something that you took on, what was it, about two or three years ago, right? Um, three years, yeah. Three years ago. And, you know, it was just really a bad timing thing. I think you had a great thing going. And then the UIEGA came down, and it, it just kind of stopped everything that that was, you know, starting up there. Yeah, it was Sporting Bet was going to buy it. They were going to give us $250 million for it. Oof. And then after they passed the the bill, it, it was worth nothing, zero. Right. So that was seventy-five cents. That was my biggest loss in my life. And you know, did you were you in touch, like in terms of what was going on there? I mean, did you guys have lobbyists? Um, you know, no. were you in touch with industry lobbyists, and you thought that this was a possibility of going down? Uh, a lot of money at stake. Well, you know, they, the the bigger poker sites might have been. We weren't. Uh, at least the management wasn't, uh, I, and I didn't know it for sure. Uh, I know that uh, somebody came to me and told me about that it might happen, and I offered to make a big bet that it wouldn't happen. But uh, you didn't want to bet on. Come on, I, I wanted to bet that it wouldn't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've got gambler. I thought. I mean, I thought there was no chance. Yeah. You know, the, it's just uh, well, they, it wouldn't have passed if it, this guy hadn't have uh, right. slid it in on the right. back back end of the port security bill. You know. Yeah, I think, you know, I think we all think that, you know, and I just want to ask you, how do you feel, you know, we all know, or maybe not everybody knows, the Doyle's Room is coming back into the States now. Yeah, they're back in the States. All right, I know it's taken, a, you know, a lot out of you when the law passed, and, you know, it's a difficult thing to deal with. How, how do you feel now? You guys are coming back. Do you feel like, you energized? you feel like it's going to work out? I think that uh, it's not going to be as easy now because it's so hard to get money on and off sites. They tell me that, uh, uh, like, 1,000 or 1,500 players will come to the Doyle's Room, and... Only like three uh, percent become uh, uh, money players. Money players, yeah. yeah. And the reason for that is they can't get money to the side. And and so why would you know? It's hard for these players to leave full pill, tilt or poker stars or one of the or ultimate bet where they've got money there. They probably can transfer money around. Uh, and the players aren't jumping around like they used right, to. Right, right, right. And another thing that's hurting us is. If you're a morning player, you sure should come to Doyle's Room because uh, we've got like fifteen or 20,000 players in, you know, up to about 2 o'clock Pacific, mm-hmm. and then the, they're all European players. You have 80% oxygenarians? <laughs> they're well, I don't know what the hell, uh, what does that mean? 80-year-olds. <laughs> 80 80 <laughs> all, all good for morning poker. <laughs> but, but anyway, they go to, they, they go to um, the Europeans start going to bed, and the time, you know, the prime time for Americans... There's not as many games as I, as I would like for it to be on there, and uh, it goes down probably four or five thousand players on, 
um, right. instead of instead of twenty. That's actually a really good point because you know I, when I play, a lot of times I I get up early in the morning. Uh, my fiance's got a six year old, so I get up early in the morning with him, and I like to play sometimes at like seven thirty eight in the morning. That's and and cool. there's not a lot of games like I play on full tilt, and there's not a lot of games come, going on there. Come to Doyle's room. I'm there. <laughs> I'm there, man. There's no, there's no big games, uh, you know, real black. Good, I can't tilt. lose this. Do you guys still yeah. have Badoogie though? You were the only site that no, had Badoogie on no, there, right? No, that was that was Tribeca Network. That, oh, okay. And uh, they sold out, I think, to uh, Playtech. Okay. Now I saw you on TV um, in late October. And a lot of people um, didn't really catch this, but it was really, really interesting. I know you'd be into this. The whole high-stakes golf thing that was recently oh, yeah, on ESPN. Yeah, right. I mean, first of all, I want you to discuss high-stakes golf, but golf is almost taken over in the sense that a lot of these big, big-time poker players spend more time playing golf than they do playing poker now, right? Yeah, a lot of the guys do like, like to play golf. I mean, there's, golf's fun, uh, <laughs> especially, you know, when you're gambling and, uh, and there's a lot of games. Uh, I think these guys are a little bit... Uh, too tough to match up with, but uh, I think you're too tough to match up with. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I've heard. I've heard that you have a lot of game. Yeah, huh? I've heard you have a lot of game. I used to uh-huh. have. I don't anymore. I mean, I can't uh, hit it. You can't play golf if you can't get it out there, and I can't. Well, the I whole can't. My leg has, uh, won't let me shift my weight properly. I find it. I find it intriguing that there's a whole matchup system, or in terms of ga- you know gambling and golf as an art too. So you've got a guy. I'm not going to mention any names, but a very very successful high stakes you know poker player who you know values himself very high, you know usually in poker but in life. Right. So he goes in and he starts starting off and he plays golf and he might not take a big a handicap as he should, right? And oh, he's constantly ego. taking the worst of it because of his ego. Just ego right? you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it happens. I think, I, th- I think most I think most of the guys in poker figure it out pretty quick. And I'll tell you what, uh, I play a little bit of poker and I play a little bit of golf. And the hardest game you've ever got is on the first tee of a golf course with these suckers. I'll tell you what, is it, that you spend hours in the first tee making up a match with these guys because <laughs> there's nobody gi- there's nobody giving an inch. It's ridiculous. Yeah, right, it's, right, it's, right. It's, it's a big joke. You got to give action to get action. And, I mean, I, and back when I when I could play, you know, I knew what I could shoot. I mean, I could I'd match my game up to four, if I shot 79 or 80, I probably would win. If I shot down low below that, I would win uh, pretty good. And if, if I shot over that, I'd lose. And uh, and I would match my games up to that. And, you know, and, and everybody, I guess we knew more about the other guy's game than they know today. Yeah. And they would come in here, the... Uh, where this high stakes golf came from was from Jack Binion when he started inviting all the high rollers out, and we called it the PGI, the Professional Gamblers Invitational. <laughs> <laughs> and he would uh, check around on the players and find out what kind of player they were, and he would set the matches. And and you had to play that. Oh, match. you just had to play it. Yeah, you well, had. That's to. actually a pretty good way. Oh, I yeah, like that. Yeah. Now, the, having an independent guy make the matches. Now with the high stakes golf, it was a scramble format of three teams, right? That was uh, one day. One of them. One yeah. day, and and how you guys just come to a consensus? I I was so surprised. Yeah. It, it was Dewey, and I was were the ones that were going to have to handicap it, and I was trying to figure out uh, the strokes and everything, you know, and how to make the teams even. And he said, "Well, we'll." Handicapped by distance. I said, "What are you talking about?" So he had to, he had the good players teeing off from back to the black tees. He had another set of tees for the players not quite that good, and another set for uh, the worst players, and then the guys that couldn't knock it out of their shadow, like me. We were way <laughs> up here. Yeah. And uh, and so it was amazing how equal it was, how, how equal the teams were. We had nine teams in the in the two men. Thing, and seven of them had a good chance to win that that day. And in fact, you know, what shows you that it was that everybody liked it. They wanted to go play it again after it was over, the same game. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's good. Well, speaking of high stakes gambling, how about let's talk a little bit about high stakes poker. I got to tell you, I'm addicted. Obviously, people know I used to commentate live with the bike high stakes cash games. This, you know, recently season four, the biggest cash game, five hundred thousand dollar buy-in. There's a couple of uh, hands I want to ask you about, but before I even get into that, it looked like you weren't really all that pleased by some of the shenanigans that were going on at the table. Um, 
usually having to do with Sammy Farha and Jamie Gold. It was just like, you know, it was almost like you and Barry were like, come on, let's just play poker. And these guys are trying to, you know, they're making deals. And, you know, I think you, see, yeah, I actually watched one today. You're like, you know, we've seen four hands in the last 30 minutes. Well, it is, it, you know, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> can, you ask, can you actually say that, that, that if your father could see this, he would come out of his grave and slap you upside the head playing in the game. I thought that was one of the greatest lines in the history of televised yeah. poker. I, I'm a poker purist, I guess. I mean, I'm going to play poker for poker's sake. I, I'm not an entertainer. Uh, you know, I'm not a comedian. I'm a poker player, you know. And seeing these guys uh, throw the fits and uh, scream and jump up, and uh, it's just... Uh, it, it, I think it detracts from the game. Now, very, very interesting hand uh, that was played between uh, you and Jamie Gold. And I don't know if you guys saw, but I'm going to go through it right now. Sure. Where basically Jamie Gold check raised Doyle on the turn with a smaller flush and Doyle folded. Um, and basically the hand was Doyle, it was limped around six ways. Doyle had eight ten of spades and Jamie had nine seven of spades. And the pot was $8,000. And the board came out king, four, jack, king of spades, four of spades, jack of diamonds. So both players had a flush draw, got checked to Doyle. Uh, he bet 6,000, folded back to Jamie, who called from up front, so the pot was 20,000. The turn was the ace of spades, third spade, ace, king, jack, spades, or ace, king, four, spades, jack of diamonds. Got checked to Doyle again. He bets 25,000. Jamie makes it 125,000. And uh, again, sometimes you can't tell. Doyle ponders for a moment. And folds. Um, now, my question to you was, and, and, and you know, a lot of people on the internet said, well, you know, you seem to think that, you know, Jamie obviously was very, very strong, and he thought he was very strong, and that, that was. What I he knew was. that he. Hard to tell when a man thinks he's got the best hand. Right. I knew that he thought he had the best. Right. Hand. Right. I know that. I, I don't usually hold people like I held him, mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to see because it wasn't just a hundred thousand; it was going to cost me five hundred thousand because I wasn't going to throw my hand away. Right. You right. Know? At the end. And so, I mean, I've got 33000 in there, and I'm going to have to put 500000 more in, knowing that this guy thinks he's got the best hand. And, uh, you know, there's two flushes that can beat me, the queen flush or the jack flush. And uh, so I said, well, I'll, I'll look for a better spot. Now, my question to you, though, about that hand, and it hasn't really been mentioned, but I was looking back at the hand, and it struck me right away, was that, you know, in your spot, Jamie had been throughout the show, and I know you don't have the liberty to see the cards like we did, had been betting his two-way draws. So when I saw King Four Jack with two spades out there, I was thinking to myself, "Well, you, you know, wanted to be at Queen Ten. well, yeah, but but I was thinking to myself, he was first to act before Doyle. So I'm thinking to myself, would he not bet a pair in a flush draw, which would have been a Jack High flush because mm -hmm. of the Jack? Would he not have bet a flush and a straight draw, which would have been Queen Ten or Queen Nine? I, I would have thought to myself, maybe the only hand I would have been scared there of there was Queen Rag of Spades." Or the nut flush draw, but of course the ace comes on the turn. I mean, was that something that was going through your head? Well, you've been watching him, you know. I mean, he, yeah. he, he, he uh, sometimes he plays his big hand slow. Uh, right. At least what I've, I've said. I don't watch it, those shows, but the few, few right. times that I have watched, uh, I've noticed that, uh, which was really kind of surprising to me. Because, you know, I don't, a lot of times you don't see their hands. And he had some big hands that he played very slow, which really surprised me. Uh, but uh, you know, he's he's got a ways to go yet. <laughs> does uh, does your strategy there change any? I mean, I know you you spent your life playing with uh, guys that you think maybe are the marks or whatever, and and you know, and in that spot, you know, where you have third nut flush, you're willing to lay down this hand, knowing that. You're going to be playing with these guys for a long, 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 long time, and you're going to get a better chance, and you're going to get the money in the long run. Now, when you're on high stakes poker, and you know that you're playing for like you know a maximum, maybe say 20 hours, does your strategy change at all? Where you might be more willing to go with that hand, or a hand of that nature, because this game isn't going to go forever, and you might not get as many shots at Jamie Gold as you might get the yeah, game back in the day. For sure, uh, it. it it makes you play differently. Uh, you know, I don't really try to get too fancy on those. I think I've played 12 times. I've won 12 times. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't try to to make any any wild plays. You know, I might pick up once in a while, but uh, basically, I just play good, 
type solid poker because these guys are, you know, the bunch of maniacs. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know they're doing it for the TV show. Yeah, That's the they're, thing. they're showing off, and I'm trying to, I'm yeah, trying to win the money. Trying to make some money. Well, exactly. there, there was a little bit of criticism um, in the hand that you had against Guy with the ace, ten of diamonds when you had the, the, the pair of aces and the nut flush draw. And I think did he, he check raise you, and then you, and you pretty, pretty much put it in on a three bet on the turn. And the question was, was you know, on, you know, a lot of people were saying, well, was Doyle doing this out of frustration here? I mean, were you surprised that you had the best hand there? Well, my, the time, my time clock might have, have expired by there, then. On that <laughs> hand, yeah. It, just, it kind of seemed like, you know, again, people said that, well... Well, I've talked to Gee a lot. You know, he he talks to me, you know, and I know that, that he is capable of making a play with nothing there. Uh-huh. Uh, so I wasn't going to throw my hand away with two diamonds out there, and so... I didn't have very much left anyway. I just put the rest of it in. And, you know, one of the most amazing hands, you know, before, you know, we move on from, from high stakes poker here, and I saw you actually get up from the table because it looks like you were frustrated by the shenanigans, was the hand between uh, Sammy Farha and Jamie Gold where... The Kings versus Yeah, hand. you know, Gold wow. limps, Farha raises... It's the most amazing hand in poker. Gold just calls, and, you know, Sammy's like, well, if you check in the dark, I'll bet. So, uh-huh. if, you know, Gold checks... Sammy bets, Gold check raises blind, and Sammy three bets, and we haven't seen a flop yet. So Gold's like, well, if I call, what are we going to do, throw four cards out here? Right. And that's exactly what they did, and the board came out 10, 6, 9, 4, because right. remember, there was no betting on the flop because right. it had already gone in. Then Farha threw 100,000 on the turn-in position, and Gold called 391 in the pot. The river paired the board at 10, and it was almost like Jamie scared Sammy in value betting. It looked like Sammy had less than a pot-sized bet there on the river. That was the worst check I've ever seen. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I actually got to watch this, and uh, when we were, uh, during our uh, poker after dark that we did, they Maury brought me in, and we watched this hand. And he goes, Gavin, you're gonna. This is going to be unbelievable to you. I'm going to show you this hand in real time. Yep. And we're watching the hand in real time, and then they cut to a commercial. Yeah. And they show the commercial, and they come back, and Maury says, "We haven't stopped anything." <laughs> this is the way. It, I mean, this yeah. hand went like 15 or 20 minutes. To Unbelievable. I mean, this is th- that actually was the hand where you came up with the comment about your father, wasn't it? I mean, it was. Like, it was. It was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, this was the most unbelievable hand in the in the planet. And the thing that that I find the most crazy thing ever is I I recently played at the MPL with Jamie Gold. Right. And they start talking about this hand, and Jamie Gold actually somehow is proud of himself in this hand. Right, and he's like, I don't think anybody else could have saved that money. <laughs> but but if Sammy uh, bet, he was going to no, call. No, but he, but but Jamie actually <laughs> says, he I called think, in advance. Right, right. right. <laughs> Jamie actually has got it now down to. Right. I, Jamie says, I know that Sammy had aces. I was going to fold, right. oh, and I please. talked him into checking. And I'm like, I watched the hand, Jamie. <laughs> this isn't what happened, you know. And but he's serious about this. Well, you know, and I mean, I think that, I think that, like. If you get to a guy like if you give that if you give the kings to a guy like Doyle or a guy like Chip yeah. or a guy like Phil Ivey or maybe Patrick Antonius or whatever or like a lot of these great players they're gonna lose like half of what Jamie lost right and Jamie's thinking like he might have lost the least out of this hand out of anybody in the world well, unless it's, you know I love Jamie he's out of his mind <laughs> I don't think anybody can argue that Jamie is completely nuts. Um, yeah, Jamie's Jamie. I don't think there's anybody else like him in poker, to be completely honest with you. Well, let me put that, – that's an interesting point. I wasn't even going to ask this, but let me put you in that spot. I mean, sometimes you make a limp with a big pocket pair there, and maybe you would have gone for a check raise on a ragged board. You have to lose some money in that spot, right? I mean, it wouldn't have gone down like that. If you're 500,000 deep, how do you think the hand would have played out if you're from up front? Well, I mean, it was a small raise, 3,000. I would never got into that. Yeah. How many times have you lost $500,000 in your life with a pair of kings with, with – uh, Never. Nothing else on board. <laughs> <laughs> no, you would have. Uh, you, you he probably's never lost fifty thousand dollars with kings. Yeah, Michigan. I have, but, but uh, <laughs> with you know, no more money that was in that pot. Right. You know, I mean, so you check it, and he bets, and you raise it. Yeah. Well, he'd liable not raise you back anyway, thinking you might have, you know, flopped a set. And uh, I don't know. You might lose thirty, forty thousand on that hand. Right. Now, you know, going on from here. Um, you know, what do you have you know, planned next? You don't really plan that many WPT events. Is it kind of a, you know, an abbreviated slate for you? What's next for Doyle Brunson in terms of the World Series in 08 and, you know, upcoming uh, tournaments? I'm going to play in the uh, Nevada tournaments and, and the California tournaments. 
I'm not going back east. I'm not going to go to a bunch of tournaments overseas. I'm just going to stay home. So are we going to see you at the L.A. Poker Classic then? When is that? That's in uh, <laughs> February, February, right? February. 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 Where? L.A. L.A. Oh, commerce. The commerce. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll go to the Commerce. I'll go to the back. I the uh, Bay 101 even I I like that tournament. Yeah. But uh, I mean I may not get to go this year. But as far as going to Australia and, and back to France, and back to Spain, <laughs> uh, like I just did, uh, it, I, it's not gonna be I don't blame that. you. I don't blame you. No. And you'll be back up short here for the du- well, you'll be playing at WPT Championship right here in April. Yeah, I play I play the tournaments here. Well, the, 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 I don't sorry. I don't play the uh, the the uh, what do you, the the tournaments from the World Series now, where they play circuit events. Circuit yeah, events. Yeah, yeah. I probably won't play any of those. Any of those. But we'll <laughs> see you at the World Series. I'll be there. All right. Well, yeah. I want I want you to know one thing though, Doyle. I wanted to always say, to tell you this in our interview. I, I don't know if I've ever got the chance to tell you this, but uh, Bill Edler and myself uh, obviously are fantastic friends. We've talked a lot of poker over the years, and uh, both of us uh, have both said a number of times to each other. Um, that you are actually the man that has changed our life in in tournament poker, in, in no limit poker. Um, because of Super System, you had a paragraph in your book that we read that talked about how, you know, you could afford to take the worst of it in some pots because you you picked up all those small pots along the way. And, uh, and Bill and I, uh, for me, it took maybe three or four times to read this before finally a light came on. Bill, he's a lot smarter than I. He probably got a little quicker. But both of us, it was it was like an epiphany. It was uh, unbelievable what this one paragraph. Yeah, and, especially and back in the begin, I, beginning days. It was, it was really a strong thing. I truly believe that you are the man that has written the one paragraph in poker that is the most ground moving thing that has ever been written in poker and I think you deserve credit for that and you know I thank you bro you you know that was that's yeah. unbelievable you got it thank you bro <laughs> <laughs> well hey, Texas hey Do- I just called <laughs> Doyle Brunson bro how cool is that <laughs> Texas Dolly Doyle Brunson thank you very very much for coming on uh, the show and spending some extended time with us good luck well, as you move you. on thank to uh, day two and we'll see you around thank you it's my uh, pleasure we will be back here to wrap things up on Poker Road Radio Want to learn how to play poker like multiple prelim event winner Joe Seabock? Or perhaps you want to learn how to bubble the TV final table over and over and over again. The Bear taught Seabock, let him teach you. PokerRoad.com is the only site where you can get exclusive audio tips from poker champion Barry Greenstein. Click on Tips from the Bear to download the podcast today. are back right here on Poker Road Radio from Las Vegas, from the Blasio, in the Bear Greenstein suite. And I got to say, you know, the first part of that interview, Joe, you know, mainly, you know, concentrated on Chip, and you could tell that Doyle was a little bit down in the sense that, right. you know, it, one of his best buddies had just, you know, passed away. Sure. When he started speaking about himself, though, uh, you know, it's just really, really great. He pepped up a little, you yeah. know, and we we're lucky too. I mean, the time, obviously, to get Doyle in an interview is not... You know, after he's been playing for 12 hours at, you know, 9 o'clock at night, that's just, that's when we got him. Right. But I thought, you know, I thought he did pretty well, man. He cranked it out. You know, it's tough, dude. I mean, he was a trooper. up there, baby. Yeah, he was a trooper. I like the fact that also he talked about how he's a poker purist, and even though he understands the business side, that, you know, I almost got the inference that he's almost getting a little old for all the types of, like, you know, debauchery and shenanigans that went on in high stakes poker. Oh, 100%. You know, know, all those guys, I mean, I think, you know, him and certainly Chip was this way and and Bear, all those guys are just like, let's just play poker. You know, at the end of the day, they just want the money. I think Doyle said it perfectly, you know, he was playing for the money, you know, and all the kids like me and, you know, (laughs) and Jamie and everybody coming up, now it's a fame game and those guys obviously don't buy into it as much. Now, I must say, as we conclude here, you were very, a very fiery fellow today when you came (laughs) here. I just hate this game. I mean, (laughs) you're going in tomorrow with 125,000 in chips, just what you started with today. What's going to happen here? I mean, 
I mean, you seem you got it together mentally, right? I mean, you've been yeah, doing this yeah. for a while. No, of course, of course. What will happen? I'll probably run it up to 600,000, then I'll drop down to 100,000, then I'll run it you know, up to 500,000, I'll go down to two. You know, I, I'm happy with how I'm playing. I'll just keep playing my game. You know, hopefully things will work out a little bit better. Well, the one do. thing that's been happening to me at the Blagio, and it's so effing, oh, it's making me so mad. Every time I have two aces or two kings, I get no action. Every time. If somebody raises, I re-raise, they fold. If, if it folds to me and I raise, everyone, I mean, it's, it's like uncanny. Mm-hmm. Every time I pick up two aces, I'm like, yes, I'm going to you know, I'm gonna get some action. I'm freaking Joe Seabot, for God's sakes. I, I never have a hand. So I'm like Lawsuit. assuming. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always assuming. Uh, how fitting will that be if he if he loses a big hand? With yeah, pocket I'm always tomorrow. assuming they're gonna come over the top and they just fold. Beep, done. So that shit needs to end, man. That shit needs to end. Well, good luck to Joey. Uh, hopefully he will do well with 165 people 25. left. 25. Oh, 165, 165 people left. So we will be back tomorrow. Gavin coming back along yep. with us. So see you next time. I'm Bart Hansen for Joe Seabog. Good night, everybody on Poker Road Radio. Later.